Hey guys, hope you're hanging in there this week. Um, we have a little bit different format for you for this talk. What we're going to be doing is having a discussion, almost like an interview, about this passage rather than me just kind of telling you about it. I'm here to talk with Trent about that. Um, so to start that off, I'm just going to kind of give you a little bit of a summary of this passage. Um, this is Acts 16 uh, verses 11 through 24. Um, and this is a pretty interesting passage. What happens is at the beginning, Paul and Luke are going to find a place to pray and they come across Lydia, a believer, and they end up baptizing her and she's very hospitable to them. Um, she invites Paul and Luke to their to her house and they go and, and stay with her. Um, this turns out to be a very fruitful relationship down the road. Then later when they're going out to pray, um, they come across a spirit-possessed slave girl who is actually making money for her owners by fortune telling. She's able to do this because of the spirit that's inside of her. But Paul casts this, this demon or the spirit out of her and she doesn't have this ability anymore. And what, and what ends up happening is the slave girl's owners get really upset with Paul and Silas because they kind of cut off their, their revenue stream. And so they seize them. They have this really illegitimate trial. They end up getting Paul and Silas beaten up and then thrown into prison. So quite a turbulent passage here with what's going on. Um, can dive right into the interview here. Trent, how you doing? <laughs> doing good, man. How are you? I'm hanging in there. Hanging in there. I'm, I, I wish we could go outside more. I wish we could do more, but you know, doing what I can. Yeah. So Taylor, how, how do you approach a passage like this? So there's like tons of different things coming at you. Spirit possession. There's a ancient Rome and, and, and culture. There's like suffering and, and beatings that take place. Like as you're reading this, what, what are some of the things that that you're you're thinking about in your mind ahead of time like how do you interpret a passage like this how do you notice what's important yeah i mean it's tough this is one of those passages where you really have to be aware of the cultural context of what's going on you know the the place of prayer the the relationship with a slave girl and an owner and you know making money by by fortune telling these are all things that we're not familiar with these things don't really happen around us very often so we kind of have to study the, the ancient culture Later we see there's this whole debate about Paul and Silas being Roman citizens and what that means for them being in prison. Um, so it's one of those where you, you kind of have to put your you know archeologist hat on and go see, try to figure out the, the history of, of this passage. But there's still some relevant stuff here, I think. When you know we're talking about prayer, when we're talking about persecution for the sake of the gospel, these are themes that still happen in our day and age, in our context, and even stuff like slavery still happens in the world today. Um, even if it looks a little bit different, you know, this is still a relevant passage for us, even though it's it's a bit different because of the, the culture and the context. Yeah, absolutely. So um, <clears throat> what are some of the cultural barriers that are being crossed in this passage for Paul and, and Silas and, and Luke as they're going on this mission? Like what, what kinds of um, steps are they taking? What, what will be awkward and even in our culture, maybe that Paul and Silas do in this particular passage? Yeah, well, the, I, there's a couple things. I mean, going out to find a place to pray and, and meeting this woman, Lydia, this is a little bit, this isn't something that happens normally. Like, normally there aren't, you know, men going out and, and finding women and talking with them about stuff. That's just kind of not really a cultural norm. Totally. But Paul and Silas are kind of going out there. They're they're bold for the sake of the gospel. They're willing to go out and, and break these these cultural norms in order to, to find people that the, otherwise they wouldn't find. If they were staying in their you know, little cultural box of what they're supposed to do, they wouldn't have found Lydia, they wouldn't have encountered the situation, the gospel wouldn't have been spread in this way. Um, and so that's one thing that's going on. Um, so real quick on that, oh, so yeah. that might immediately come across as like really, really weird, right? But yeah, what's, what's Paul's like normal habit as he goes into various cities? Like where does he usually start? Yeah, well Paul usually starts with anybody that he knows that's a Christian. But then he, he's willing to just go out wherever God leads him. And it's really interesting to see how trusting he is of the Spirit guiding him in different situations. If he was going out just on whatever he thought might make sense, he would probably run into a lot of, you know, awkward situations, difficult situations. And if God didn't want him there, it wouldn't go very well. But every situation that we see Paul getting himself into, he, he's led there for some reason. There's some something that God has for him in that situation or in that new relationship that might mean breaking a cultural norm or breaking a, you know, a barrier that exists in that society, but he's willing to do it because God has set up those, those avenues for him. 
Yeah, and this is something that Luke would assume, but if, if Paul is going out to this, this riverside, this would be sort of like second best to a synagogue in the sense that you have these, these women that are gathered out by the river in order to pray. Normally, Paul goes into a synagogue and, and preaches the gospel from there, but there's not enough Jewish men, it seems, in, in the city of Philippi. It's not a highly Jewish area. Mm -hmm. And so he kind of goes to the second best spot and, and, and meets his women. Though he, he transgresses that, that law, it's not as if Paul and, and Silas are kind of like seeking out women in this weird way. <laughs> this is like yeah. a second best synagogue situation and so there he meets Lydia who's this really wealthy person which is also sort of like a, a culture breaking moment where Lydia is pretty well to do um, and and maybe a little bit elite now talk, talk about this like demon um, oppressed uh, girl here like what how does that cross like a social barrier as Paul is dealing dealing with her and 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 what's going on there yeah well, this, I think this is another situation where there's this relationship between these owners and this slave girl. The slave girl is enslaved presumably because she has this spirit that's possessing her and giving her these special abilities. And this is kind of a, this is obviously a strange relationship, but it's one that you wouldn't interfere with normally. Like Paul or anyone else, like you kind of just let them do their thing. You kind of just leave them to do whatever they're going to do. The owners have the, have a right to, you know, own this girl in this society and you don't really interfere with that which is why as soon as as soon as paul and silas step into the situation paul casts out this this demon or the spirit the owners get so upset they're like whoa you can't you can't mess with us you can't do this like this is our this is our world this is our person this is our you know almost a business like you know you can't be interfering with us um so that's kind of what's going on there it's a, it's a bit of a it is a very strange situation yeah and, and and Paul and Silas, they come in and, and they have no problem not only preaching the gospel to Lydia in this context, crossing that social barrier of like male to female, but mm -hmm. then they also have no problem crossing the barrier of like this economic barrier that's set up, right? Where it's like, usually you go into a city and you kind of follow the social norms that are there. They have no problem just completely upsetting that for the sake of the gospel. Mm -hmm. and, and that I think is the key point, right? As the gospel advances, it really does change culture and it changes whole cities it changes the way you think about the world and paul and silas have an authority given by god um that that upends these things and it's normal for it to cause a lot of frustration like if somebody walked into your room <laughs> and started to like turn over your bed and like move your furniture like how do you think you you would respond i'd be like um this is like mine what are you doing like <laughs> can you please go away like well even like dude don't touch my bed that's my bed yeah. bro like yeah <laughs> get out of my house right or get out of my room like you don't have authority you don't own this right mm -hmm. well who do you think you are is really the question that's being that's being brought up here and um now talk about a, a little bit we have just a couple more minutes left like maybe the, the suffering aspect of this, right? So it's like they respond, the magistrates respond pretty negatively to this mm -hmm. and they see what's being done. They're not like, oh, yay, like liberation from spiritual oppression. Like they've mm -hmm. been using that for their own benefits, right? Yeah. Um, so talk about like how Paul and Silas respond to to suffering. Like should, the, should, should we expect similar things? Should we expect to run into angels and, and demons and, and spiritual forces of wickedness in high places as we're preaching the gospel like what yeah what, what should that look like in the christian life do you think yeah that's a tough question i mean it, it's tough to discern what's really going on in a lot of situations it's it's tough to know where angels and demons might be working and i think i believe that there is um you know a spiritual realm that's around us there are angels and demons that exist and that can do different things in in our world um, it's very easy to get distracted by this whole exciting concept of like what might be going on here. Um, personally, I, I haven't encountered this kind of a situation, so I don't know exactly how I would handle it. I might ask you as a pastor, like, how would you handle that kind of a situation? <laughs> yeah, you put me on the spot there. Yeah. Well, I don't have a significant amount of, um, inter interactions or haven't had a significant amount of interactions with, with demon oppressed people. Uh, in general, but at the same time, I think whenever you see uh, the enemy's work, whether that's uh, in a more overt, obvious way like this, or more subtle ways, um, in sort of leading people into temptation, that's obviously what uh, the book of Matthew describes as one of the enemy's like key roles is to lead into temptation, to promote sin, to promote the flesh, to promote uh, slavery and bondage to sin. So. 
just because we don't see maybe an obviously demon oppressed person doesn't mean that we don't see the work of demons or doctrines of demons like like james is talking about and so i would say as a pastor my primary interaction with with demons has been in just teaching the gospel or preaching the gospel every single week it's it's an ongoing struggle and there are definitely consequences both in my life and the people around me uh in terms of like the the difficulty that comes as a result of doing that now we lived in we live in like a 21st century um and there are a lot of freedoms that we have in the United States specifically. So we, we deal with this at a, at a different level, but I would say that, um, just because we don't see them, um, actively participating in our lives, the way we see it here, doesn't mean that they're not active and participating. And I think a great resource that helps us to see how subtle, uh, demons work is just by reading something like screw tape letters that kind of opens your eyes. This is obviously CS Lewis, extra biblical, but, um, it opens your eyes to seeing like just the subtlety and the craftiness of the, of the enemy. Mm-hmm. And so um, I haven't uh, participated in an exorcism or specifically cast out demons, but that doesn't mean that just through the basic Christian faithfulness and life that I haven't interacted with significant opposition to the gospel going forward. Right? Yeah. So yeah. And I think that's a really good point that you know I've I've read the screw tape later letters. It's a it's a great book and, and one of the key takeaways from it is just how you know there's there's a lot of deception in a seeming normal, right? If demon possessed people or spirit possessed people were going around like crazy zombies looking to kill people, it'd be easy to avoid them, right? <laughs> like you'd be like that person's obviously something's wrong there. Yeah. I'll just avoid them. But that's often not the case. It, it you know, there's a lot of, of subtlety and kind of trying to make things look okay um, that goes on with temptation and work that demons are doing that we kind of have to be aware of. And that's kind of what it more often looks like. Um, I don't know why in this situation it was abundantly obvious that there was this spirit possessed um, girl who Paul could come along and cast the demon out of her. But that's the story that we're given in this context. Yeah, and it comes as a result of, of the preaching of the gospel. So there, there is something in Philippi specifically, and this goes back to the cultural analysis part of it, right? There is something in Philippi. There is a cultic practice in Philippi that's specifically being addressed here. Whereas in our context, in our culture, usually it's secularism, right? It's, it's atheism. It's sort of like a, a scientism that's pervasive in our culture. And so the authority structures are, are different. Um, mm-hmm. And so here you have this cultic practice of of uh, soothsaying or fortune telling that Paul is specifically going after and addressing. That was probably the biggest barrier to the gospel advancing in this particular context, right? Mm-hmm. And and even economically, that was the biggest barrier for there being uh, like equality in some ways too. Mm-hmm. The gospel bring, being brought to bear even at the society level. And so I think that that's why you see it uh, as prominent and even as primary to the gospel advancing in Philippi is this like economic wealth uh, discrepancy that was that was happening there. Mm-hmm. So what would you say just is like the main point of this passage? I think we can see that the church is is meant to go out and and find people for the sake of the gospel. Like the gospel is is meant to go out into the world. It's meant to go out and find people in all sorts of different contexts that we don't know or expect. And even though it doesn't look exactly the same as this, um, because we have a different culture where there's different economic systems and norms, we there's still this message that the gospel is meant to go out and, and find people, and we are the carriers of that, that gospel. Thirst, we miss you guys. Taylor, how much do you miss Thirst, like on a scale of 1 to 25? Uh, like 25, man. I miss it. It's, it's so awesome just to like get together and play a game and like hang out with everyone. Um, like doing these videos is great, but like, man, I miss like seeing everyone in person every week and just having a, having a great time at church together. How often do you counsel puppets?